you will likely see more hypertrophy if you go with higher volumes. High intensity training and low volume approaches can be perfectly fine for people who are limited on time or who train more so with their preferences. But that, as far as the research goes... The other way to say that, Milo, is limited on willpower. Right. I'm kidding. Hit people, you're great. Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for RP Strength, and I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Milo Wolf, who is an expert on hypertrophy, an expert on range of motion, and an expert on beards. Fortunately today, beards will not be discussed, but training volumes, which means how much you do in the gym, usually measured in number of sets per session or per week. What is the relationship of training volumes to muscle growth? How much is enough? Just to set up the conversation really quick, we already know from previous research that especially for beginners and people just coming back to fitness, one to three sets per muscle per week provide robust gains. But I think some people forget that robust gains is detectable gains. It does not mean the best possible gains. And then so muscle growth continues to be higher and higher the more volume you do. And in some studies, that continuation has led to something like 50 or so sets per muscle per week, split over three workouts. That has resulted in at least short-term gains that are the highest. So it's a huge spectrum of lots of things cause gains, depending on the situation, that some extreme volumes can be useful. And that's the jump off point where Dr. Milo Wolf tells me how much of what I said is wrong and corrects everything. Pretty much everything you said was right. I'm sorry to tell you. Before we go into the findings of this most recent meta-analysis that included 35 studies or so for hypertrophy. So Ooh, large that's meaty. Data set. That's meaty. For mm. strength, it was 66. That's really meaty. Yeah, so it's a lot of studies. Regardless, before we go into that, the general conceptual understanding of volume and hypertrophy so far has been an inverted U relationship. As you mentioned, there is such an amount of volume where you see some hypertrophy, but not your best. And that might be around one to three sets. That would be the start of that inverted U relationship. As you increase volume, you will see more growth. You kind of climb up that inverted U and you see more growth as you do more volume. But theoretically, there then comes a plateau where doing more volume past that doesn't necessarily increase growth anymore. It just kind of gives you the same growth because at that point, maybe you're struggling to recover. Yes. There's no additional benefit. Or less growth. Correct. That is when you get into the final end of that inverted U relationship. Yes. The problem so far is that in many of my years of searching, they've actually never really robustly and reliably found even the top of the U. They've definitely found where it starts to get close, but it's still going. It's like climbing the next mini peak on the way to Everest. And you're like, this has to be the peak. And you look up and you're like, fuck, there's still more shit up there. So obviously, if you do 200 sets for your biceps every week, you're going to lose muscle. You're going to get rhabdo, necrosis, and all this other shit. Don't try that at home. People have done that a few times. So we know that limit is some, something insane. But we don't quite know how high that limit goes. And this meta-analysis looked at lower, moderate, and higher volume training studies on aggregate, I assume. And what are, what are some of the take-homes that you got from this meta that you think are insightful? Well, basically exactly what you said more volume leads to more growth. And we have studies looking at pretty high volumes. So I recently looked at the research myself as well, and we have around eight studies looking at high volumes in excess of 20 sets per week per muscle. Like that's what I categorize as extremely high volumes for most people. And when you look at all of these studies, a few dozen studies, as I mentioned, you see that going up in volume from say 10 sets to 30 or even 40 sets leads to more growth. I was previously on the channel to discuss the infamous 52 set quad study. And that is one of many studies that have looked at higher training volumes, yes. past 20 sets. And when you aggregate all of those, what you find is that there is a dose response relationship between volume and hypertrophy. Can you see hypertrophy even with low volume approaches, like high intensity training? Yes. Will you see your best hypertrophy? It's pretty unlikely. Right. You will likely see more hypertrophy if you go with higher volumes. High intensity training and low volume approaches can be perfectly fine for people who are limited on time or who train more so with their preferences. But that, as far as the research goes- The other way to say that, Milo, is limited on willpower. Correct. I'm kidding. Hit people, you're great. <laughs> but regardless, there is a diminishing returns effect. 
Generally, the trend you see, and I won't speak to specifics too much when discussing this study, because it's a preprint currently. It'll probably be out by the time the study is, the video is out. But roughly doubling your volume, so say going from 10 sets per week per muscle to 20 sets per week per muscle, roughly gives you 50% more relative growth. So you're doing 100% more volume for 50% more growth. That general heuristic of 2x the volume for 50% more growth holds up pretty well between around like 5 and 35 sets. Okay. So going from 5 sets per week to 10 sets per week, it's twice the volume, but it'll give you about 50% more relative growth. If you were gaining 5% of muscle in a year, you would be gaining 7.5% of muscle in a year, going from 5 sets to 10 sets. Yeah. 50% better gains is a lot. It is and relative, but it's still Relative, but 50% relative is still a lot because if your absolute gains are great, 50% relative gains a lot of absolute gain. If your absolute gains are very small, that you're super struggling to gain a pound a year, then 50% relative gains are like huge because you just wouldn't, it's so much more detectable now than it would have been. So now you need every little claw, little scratch you can get. So that makes sense. Let me take you through a list of caveats now and common critiques people have about this stuff. Real quick. Hit me. 30 to 50. Does the relationship hold? That's exactly the first caveat I was going to mention. Oh, okay. <laughs> we have less research in at the very top end. As I mentioned, we have around eight studies now looking at high volumes in excess of 20 sets per week per muscle. But most of our research is still in the sort of neighborhood of 10 to 30 sets. Above 30 sets, we have a few studies. Don't get me wrong, we have the Briado study, we have the Ennis study, and a few others. But we don't have quite as much research. So while if you're looking at the inverted U, all we've really found from the research is go up and slowly diminishing returns. We haven't found that plateau, and we certainly haven't found the drop-off. And that's going all the way up to 30 to 40 sets. That is the first caveat. We don't have a ton of research at 30 to 40 sets per week. So while my best guess as a sports scientist is still that if you wanted to grow one muscle maximally, you should be doing high volumes. Higher than you have Higher been. Higher than you have been, in all likelihood. There's a few caveats here. One, the way that volume was counted they counted volume three different ways. One, they counted volume directly, meaning that all of your bicep training would be curls only. Yes. Or but direct isolation. Movements. Lat pull downs that you did earlier Wouldn't count for count nothing. Either. They Correct. just count for back. So they counted volume directly, but they counted it indirectly, where all sets counted the same. So a set of rows would count as one set for the biceps as well, which also probably isn't most accurate. Right. But then they also counted volume fractionally, where they made certain assumptions about how different movements targeted different muscles. So they would count a set of bicep curls, for example, as one set for the biceps. But they would count a set of rows as half a set for the biceps. Awesome. I've done that before. And they checked which of these models best fit the actual data. Which of these models essentially minimized residuals. F the fractional model was the best fit. Hey! It best predicted hypertrophy. So if you want to purely have a list of assumptions that best predicts hypertrophy, counting indirect volume, like compound training for your biceps, compound training for your triceps as maybe like half a set yes. is a reasonable assumption. And it's the most truthful assumption. Yeah. That is how they chose to then analyze the data set because that's what best great. fit the research. That's great. So when I'm talking about volume here, I'm talking about fractional sets. Yeah. Meaning that, for example, for 30 fractional bicep sets a week, which seems to be really effective for hypertrophy based on research, we might be talking about doing 20 sets of direct bicep work per week and 20 sets of direct back work per week because those 20 sets of direct back work would count as 10 sets for your biceps, yes. half a set for your biceps each. So it's actually very realistic. It is. This is probably one of the most realistic meta-analyses because a direct and indirect both suffer from really big error, errors of analysis. And so this is kind of like, man, it, in your program, like if you count all your pushing movements as half tricep, full mm -hmm. chest, you count um, your pulling movements as some bicep, et cetera, then it's really going to tell you when you add it up in your program, oh, how many sets am I doing compared to these studies? And then you get a real world feel. Correct. And so the volume recommendations I'm making might sound pretty high, but in reality, if you increase your volume a little bit, you can very easily get to 30, maybe even 40 sets for your biceps or triceps or what have you. And importantly, there are assumptions baked in here, right? Like does a set of rows really count as half a set towards your biceps? Why not 0.75, et cetera? And we'll get to more realistic assumptions over time in exercise science. For example, now we have some studies comparing the dumbbell curl to the dumbbell row for bicep growth. We have a study comparing the underhand pull, overhand pull down to the dumbbell curl for bicep growth. And these studies can start informing our understanding of how different movements 
count for different muscles. Because they can directly measure the growth Correct. and then say, actually, it was two thirds, or actually, it yep. was one third, or actually, it was half. For example, the study on pull downs we have found similar bicep growth from pull downs as bicep curls. So if you wanted to use this research to inform how you count volume, if you want to get really nitty gritty, you could say one set of pull downs counts as roughly one set for biceps as well. But we're slowly getting to that stage. But having made this list of assumptions, a fractional fit is a more realistic way of counting volume. It predicts hypertrophy better. That's one caveat. The second caveat is people will say, what about trained lifters? Many of these studies take place in untrained lifters, right? So sure, high volumes might work better there, but I think that trained lifters need less volume because you get better pushing yourself, et cetera. They actually performed a subgroup analysis looking at only studies in trained lifters versus only studies in untrained lifters. What are we counting as trained? I think in this case, it was over six months of training experience. So it's at least some training experience. So very, very different than what most Correct. people say is trained, but Correct. nonetheless, not new beginners. Correct. If you would expect that as you become more trained, you need less volume, you would still see that effect play out to an extent in this comparison of completely untrained to trained. Unless that effect started at much higher Of course, but ages. you would need a real sort of like a real strong rationale as to why that would be the case. Most effects, I would say- I, I could give a, a strong rationale. Hit me. Uh, you've accreted enough muscle size and strength to now be so big and strong that you can't possibly have enough recovery ability and conditioning to get through the stuff you used to. Whereas after the first six months of training, you have put on some muscle size and strength, but not a ton in the grand scheme, but your ability to recover and your conditioning has escalated a ton. So, you know, when it's your first six months, you're just better at working out. When it's your first six years, you're now doing such heavy lifts that fuck you up so much. that are so close to your limits of adaptation. They take something from you. You don't just get back right away. What do you think about that? Bullshit on the spot or some value? I think the alternative stance is stronger. It's not that I can say we have evidence to the contrary, but I think that in the research, you do observe that muscle growth and strength gains slow down as you become more trained and you will gain the, like the majority of your muscle size and strength in the first few years of lifting. And importantly, in this case, we're talking about trained lifters, not super trained, but at least six months or 12 months of training experience, at least with a Smith analysis. That will include some studies like the NS study where people were squatting on average three plates plus to depth. So relatively strong and realistically, would the average participant in that study get much strong with an additional five years of lifting? Maybe to a decent extent, but maybe not quite enough to really change their volume requirements dramatically, at least. And I think there's absolutely cases like you just mentioned, where people get way more muscular as they keep lifting and keep lifting, especially if they have great genetics, like yourself, for example, right? Like when you started lifting, from what I remember you telling me, you didn't gain a ton of muscle at first. And then as you kept lifting and improving your training, et cetera, you actually grew appreciably more as you became more trained. It was both. I gained a lot at first and then the next year and the next year and the next year. The next there you year. go. There's certainly cases like that. And some people will get absurdly big and strong. But for most people, most of their strength gains and size gains will come relatively early into a lifting career. So I think the research is leaning in favor of saying volume requirements probably don't change a ton as you become more trained. That is, I think, what the stronger stance is here. But I can see how, especially for very trained lifters, it's a bit of an uncharted territory situation. For sure. I just think most people don't think of six months as trained lifters. Yeah. Keep in um, mind that's the bottom threshold, though. Not sure. everyone was training for exactly six months. Sure. Some of them were comfortably training for several years on that. Right, right. So you you might expect some sort of effect Correct. to be found there. You expect there. some effect if there is yeah. to be one. Right? Yeah. But they didn't really find anything. The dose-response relationship between volume and hypertrophy remained the same shape. The only thing that happened was a downward shift of the curve going from untrained to trained, such that trained lifters just saw less hypertrophy, yeah. which is exactly what we'd expect. As you become more trained, hypertrophy slows down. So that's one common critique of untrained lifters, et cetera, et cetera. Another critique is, well, in these studies, they didn't really train all that hard. And there have been studies that weren't conducted to failure. But there have also been studies, and in fact, most studies on volume are conducted to failure. Most studies in exercise science are conducted to failure. Yes, yeah. and we can have a whole discussion. Self standardizer. Correct. We can have a whole discussion around whether or not we think people are truly trained to failure or not. But yet again, if you're comparing studies where they explicitly didn't train to failure to studies where they were at least trying to train to failure, on average, the studies where they were trying to train to failure would involve participants training harder and closer to failure than the ones where they were not trying to train to failure. And across both of these, when you performed a subgroup analysis, looking at only the studies not to failure and only the studies to failure, the shape of the relationship was the same. What about the magnitude of the relationship? The magnitude was similar as well. Most of the studies are on participants trained to failure. 
But at the very least, just because you're training a bit harder doesn't mean you don't still need higher volumes to maximize hypertrophy. And higher doesn't mean 50 sets a week, but it still means relatively higher volumes than people, for example, in the high intensity training crowd are sure. advocating for. Sure. For my take on this, if you get really, really big and strong and you lift for a long time and you learn how to really produce a lot of relative effort in your lifting, and you push your body to its limits in muscle size and leanness and strength and all this other stuff, you end up being able to produce so much systemic fatigue from your lifting that your overall volume in any given week, your systemic total MRV maximum recovery volume, you can reach it no problem reliably. But that's different than the local MRV for any given muscle. And so with specialization, you know, when people said, one of those, uh, I think Brad and James Krieger's um, replication of the Radielli study, where it's 45 sets, mm -hmm. four quads, but that was 15 sets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and they didn't do a whole lot else. Systemically, for someone not super strong, that's possible to do. Even for someone super strong, systemically, that's still possible to do. And... If you were a person, let's say, who was very big, very strong, and you had a very large muscular body, big legs, huge back, but your chest and arms could use some work. If you dial back the chest, or sorry, you dial back the legs and back to maintenance volumes, which you know, are, the conversation starts at around a third of your typical volume. I mean, very low volumes will keep your legs and back. What I think a meta-analysis like this is telling us, and it's not the first to tell us, but it's really good information, is that, look, you can pump up the volume on your chest and arms as long as systemically you're still sleeping well, you're not thinking of uh, no longer coming to the gym ever again, your strength is still climbing, you're excited about training, you're making strength gains. Feel free to, over time, add a few sets here and there to your arms and chest. And as long as you're systemically feeling good, you're going to feel really, really good local results. Why am I making such a big point out of this? Because I have a secret. I know why people say low volumes work better for stronger people or bigger people. Because bigger and stronger people cannot do as much systemic number of sets because the absolute effort is so higher. The relative effort is so much higher. They just get really fucked up. But a lot of them, understandably, don't ever feel like they could dial anything back. So you tell someone... Do you think you could do 30 sets of quads in a week and recover? They go, fuck no, are you kidding me? They're not answering your question. They're answering your question with an inbuilt assumption that they're making. And the inbuilt assumption is that in the context of my current program, there's no way I can add 15 sets of quads and still survive week upon week upon week. But what if you took your back training and your hamstring training down to six sets a week? According to your research and you and Pax presented, you, you wouldn't lose any size for sure. If you did that, all of a sudden, an extra 15 sets of quads is possible. But most people just think in my current program and current setup, assuming I'm training full body and hard, is it possible for me to do 30 sets on everything? No, hell no. I mean, most people wouldn't be able to survive that just because they can't. I've watched people try it. It doesn't work. You get to about 200 total work sets per week that are hard for your whole body. You're not going to hang around for much longer. It's not even going to be a muscle growth thing. It's going to be a fatigue thing. You stop sleeping. Your motivation for training goes to hell. Your joints start feeling all fucked up. It's not sustainable. And so I think a lot of people take this whole, like, you're telling me 40 sets works. They just globally apply it to, like, my whole program, everything 40 sets. No, 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 no. Because that's not how these studies were conducted. Myla, how many of these studies in the meta-analysis, just offhand of a percent, were conducted on five to six day a week, Everything gets hit two to four times a week. We're training chest, triceps, shoulders, side delts, hamstrings, glutes, quads, cap, the whole thing with multiple exercises, multiple sets. Five or six days a week, probably zero. Zero. <laughs> zero. Right. We have young people in their prime who I would make a general assertion, and this is not meant to, from a position of hate. They don't, they're not so serious about their training usually. Why do I say that? Almost no one who's ultra serious about their training volunteers to be a part of a training study. They're going to take your training and they're going to tell you what to do instead. Almost all serious people 
the hardcore guys in the college gym, they're not, you're not going to tell them what to do. They're doing their own shit. So people that aren't overly serious about training, they're into it. They like it, but they're not psychotic about it. They're young. They can recover well. They're training smaller fractions of their body usually and with just two or three days a week. Fuck, man, you can cook those motherfuckers. 40 sets a week, that shit works great. And at the local muscular level, it probably would work great too if you had some kind of super recovery pill for jack giant people. You could just give them every day. I suppose steroids is one of those. It doesn't, doesn't do as good of a job as people think. If you could have an infinite recovery pill, yeah, you really could do 40 sets of biceps and quads and hams and everything all fucking week long and recover and adapt. But people miss that whole context of these are just a few programs uh, days per week. These are folks that train hard, but probably not hard like most people train when they're really on a, on a mission. They train really hard because they got someone yelling at them, but you can get through a program like that, whereas by yourself, you would never do that to yourself in a million years. And all those factors brought together, you can start to see, okay, so in isolated situations, very high volumes per muscle work really well. Can you survive that on a systemic scale? You're going to have to dial some muscles back, dial other muscles up, see how things go and adjust from there. What do you think about that? I think you're mostly on money. I've got several thoughts on that. The first is that I've experimented in the past with around 200 sets a week, and it is tough. And practically as a coach, that is where I would mostly draw the line. I think for most lifters, around 200 sets a week, and there's gonna be some variants around this, some people can benefit from more, some people from less, 200 sets of overall training volume Including warm-ups or not including warm-ups? Not including. Not including warm-ups. So 200 hard working sets. I think for most people, 100 is about the most they'll be able to do, but 200 is kind of like intense. 200 is intense for sure. I think that trained lifters, when you get to the sort of exotic level you're describing, I could see that being a consideration. There's a reason why I'm saying the exotic level. People look up to advanced bodybuilders who they think know everything. And these guys know a lot, but a lot of what they know is specific to their case. And so they'll tell you as the biggest guy in the gym, don't do any more than eight sets for your quads per week. And it's true for that guy in the context of his whole body program. But is it true for you? Most people are not exotically large, so they'll be able to squeeze in more volume. Yeah, I agree. And I think that people can get to higher fractional volumes than they realize, though. So in a regular five-day routine, for example, if you're doing 20 to 30 sets per session, which for many people is going to be somewhat feasible, get you in that 100 to 150 weekly sets ballpark, that can mean 20 to 30 fractional sets for many muscle groups. Mm -hmm. Not all, but many muscle groups, and that can be quite effective. In fact, we do have some studies, for example, the Brigado study, looking at relatively high volumes of around 200 sets per week for the whole body. So there are studies where they look at relatively high volumes, but for the most part, you are correct in saying that we often look at single muscle groups. And so we're essentially- Or just a few. Just a few, Mm -hmm. like maybe two, three, Mm -hmm. four tops. So essentially, we're conducting specialization phase studies. Yes. Which is great, because it means that we have a very, very strong rationale for saying that on a single muscle group level, higher volumes will produce more growth. But it doesn't tell us whether or not that is feasible to apply on a whole scale level in the context of a full body program. Very simple reason for that. That is an incredibly difficult study to run. We would need a lot of funding to even attempt that, because that would entail getting participants into the lab for five or six days a week each for often two hours per session each. A lot of man hours. That's a lot of man hours. And also you'd have to and recruit probably sample size. double the sample size because at least half those people quit. And they'll be well, tra- well trained. So we're expecting smaller effects, if anything. So it'd be even harder yeah. to take differences. Yeah. That's why we haven't done it. Yeah. And also well-trained people, like I said earlier, don't typically like give themselves up for Correct. research purposes. In this case, we might be able to because it's the study on heart training. You know, like we're expecting to push them hard for two hours every day. People would maybe sign up for that. Maybe. But then it's still a question of getting enough manpower yeah. to supervise the participants, make sure they're training hard, have them in the lab for 12 hours each per week. Big enough sample size, let's say 50 people. Oh, shit. That is an insane amount of you manpower. You need a lab. You need a few Correct. labs for that. You need to, like, thing. you know, cash out. So that's why we don't have that. But yeah. on a specialization phase basis, I can definitely make a case for higher volumes. And I think generally, if you can tolerate it on a systemic level, higher volumes will likely be better. Next caveat. People will claim that you only need high volumes if you're not resting for sufficient amounts of time between sets. And in fact, certain influencers make this claim all the time. Yeah, this new volume study found uh, better growth yes. only because they were resting for a minute yes. between Let's sets. Let's just be clear on that before you have a much more erudite uh, discussion. They're making that up. Yes. They just made that up. 
they're making that up in the sense that they looked at some of the rest time literature and said that if you're resting an insufficient amount of time, doing more sets helps. Correct. But that doesn't say anything about if you're resting an insufficient time, is four sets better than eight or is 16 sets even better than eight? And for any given long rest of time, is 16 sets better than eight, even if you take the break? It's one of those things where you pretend to have insight on something, but really it's just something that sounds like it and you don't have insight on it at all. But usually I'm just, just being facetious. Say, it's just something you say when you don't like the results of a study typically. For sure. But we actually looked at this directly. So off the top of my head, I can think of studies that had longer rest times, but still found a benefit to higher volumes. For instance, if you look at the 52 set study we discussed previously, on average, in the highest volume group, the one doing 52 sets for the last two weeks of the intervention, and you look at their session duration, they're actually taking three and a half, four minutes of rest between sets. So they were taking long rest periods, and they still saw benefit of high volumes. When we looked at the whole area of research, around 30 studies, as I mentioned, we compared studies where they took around a minute of rest to studies where they took around three minutes of rest. The relationship still held up. The relationship between volume and more muscle growth is robust to many different variables, it seems. Whether you're a bit more trained or a bit less trained, whether you're taking slightly long rest times, slightly short rest times, yes. whether you're trained to failure or training submaximally, more is more. Yes. That and if you can recover from takeaway. it, you will likely Correct. grow from Of course, that is always a caveat. But in these studies, at least on single muscle group levels, 30, 40 sets per week seems to be recoverable. Yep. Systemically, it's a different story, potentially. We just don't know that yet. Practically, we can both say, there is such a thing as too much. But where is that? We don't quite know. Sure, sure. And it's very individual dependent too. Correct. Someone will be at 100 sets and be dying. Someone will be at 150 and be cruising. Correct. The final two findings from this meta-analysis I found interesting, now that I've got all of the caveats out of the way I can think of. One, maintenance volumes. Seemingly, you can maintain muscle, like muscle mass with around two or three fractional weekly sets per week. Now, Keep in mind that is in relatively untrained populations in the context of these studies, et cetera. But around two to three hard weekly sets seems to be sufficient in these studies to maintain muscle mass. You don't need to do a ton in, say, a deload week or when you're traveling or if you have a maintenance phase or what have you to maintain muscle mass. And when it comes to an appreciable amount of muscle growth, that occurs just above that. As you've spoken about countless times, maintenance volumes are theoretically right beneath the minimum effective volume. And that is what was found in this meta-analysis as well, where around four sets a week for hypertrophy seems to be where you sort of seeing hypertrophy that is detectable mm, or above sort of measurement air related. That's areas. really insightful, Milo. So for people at home, again, these are averages. These are based on Correct. participants. They're not you. But unless it took place to part of the study, you know? then congratulations. Yeah. This is well, then, then, this is you, you. then you have to do a subject Indeed. level analysis, even then. Um, the sniff test of what is really enough volume per muscle to kind of be like, yeah, I'm doing a decent effort at growing is maybe around four sets per week. Correct. You would be okay kind of signing off on Correct. that? So four fractional sets, by the way. Uh, sure. So that could so, be two sets of back, for example, and like two or three sets of direct bicep training. Totally, totally. So if you are a person who is trying to get bigger triceps and you haven't been lifting for too long, you train pretty hard, nothing crazy, your diet's right, your sleep is good, you're like, dude, I want to get bigger triceps, but I currently, my workout is I do like three sets of pushdowns after some chest shit, and then three sets of skull crushers at the beginning of my other workout per week. What do you think? I'd be like, yeah, six sets. If you train hard, like you'll probably see some gains. And if you want more gains, just try seven, try eight, try moving up there. But they're like, no, I don't have time for that. Be like, you should expect some gains at six sets. Whereas if they were like, I, my total fractional tricep stimulus is two sets per week. I'd be like, you're probably going to delay your rate of loss by weeks and months or slow it down greatly. I just would not expect growth from that. Would you, would you say that's an okay take from that? I think that's pretty accurate. To close it off, I think there's a few more things I would add. One, currently, when you look at the model, at around 10 sets, you seem to be getting around 40% of your maximum hypertrophy. That is a rough estimate. Per muscle, per week. Correct. Fractional okay. weekly sets. So five leg press. On Monday, five squat sets on Thursday. Correct. Obviously, assuming you're not doing any lunges or anything else that could contribute. Oh, for sure. Right? That's my whole program. Correct. <laughs> That'll be your. That would get you around, based on these studies, 40% of maximum hypertrophy for a muscle. It is a diminishing return situation. So you can absolutely see growth with as few as four sets. You can absolutely use a high-intensity training routine and see growth. But 
if you want to complicate it a bit more than that, and I know people are always complaining about exercise scientists complaining, com complicating Don't, shit. Those people are just stupid. Please continue. But please, if you want to complicate it, doing more will give you more growth. That's not very complicated. It's not that complicated, more. but it's, <laughs> it's pretty complicated more, for more some better. people. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, those are all the caveats I need to give about that whole relationship. But those were the broad findings from this meta-analysis. I love it. I'll give you one more wacky take and you let me know if you can science it to death or if you're like, you shall pass in this case. What I do is I tell people, look, how many times, is I say, I want bigger triceps. Okay. How many times a week you train your triceps? doesn't matter what they say. Let's say they say two times a week. What I tell them to do is go start training triceps at a relatively low volume, six sets total, so three and three. And then I ask them, how is your recovery between sets? And we, we can talk about delayed onset soreness and all that stuff. We don't even have to say, when you come back to train your triceps again, after your last workout, do they feel strong? And are you able to perform it at or slightly above your typical level? You get a couple different answers with that. If the answer is like, ooh, yeah, some days, but some days I'm still a little kind of, I would say continue volume where you are because recovery might be a concern. If you're like, dude, no way, I'm still sore and completely broken and like actually weaker in that second workout of the week, I'd be like, this is the first workout, you should take your volume down. But for most people, especially over longer lengths of time, weeks and weeks and weeks, they'll get to a point where they think the question is like a joke. They're like, I don't understand the question. Like, When you hit triceps Monday, what do they feel like Thursday? They're like, dude, Tuesday, they feel 100%. I'm like, oh shit, add some sets. And they're like, but I could, dude, I could probably do 15 sets of triceps two days a week and still recover. I'm like, well, there you go. There's your 30. And they're like, but that's a lot of sets. And I'm like, well, work up to it slow if you can recover, which is to say, come back and have strong workouts. But you're thinking, damn, I could come back and have strong workouts with way more volume than I'm doing now. Well, there's your answer for how come volume at a high level produces growth. Now, if you truthfully get insane delayed onset muscle soreness in your biceps from two sets on Monday and two sets on Thursday, and if you try to come in on Thursday after three sets and you're literally like 80% as strong, yeah, like your local recovery is two sets per workout, four sets per week. That does happen. Very rare, possible. But if you let your recovery be a guide, at least if you can repeatedly have strong, good workouts, if you're recovering based on the literature, yeah, more is probably better. And if you're recovering from that, try a little more. What do you think? Because I used to get a lot of shit for saying that. Like, well, but you'll break people in half. I'm like, exactly how does that work with good technique and everything? I think you just get tired and you start to get a little weaker and you're like, I need a deload week. But if anything, most people don't train enough, I would say. Like most people could stand to train harder and see more muscle growth. If your performance is solid week to week, try adding more. Yes. See what happens. Yes. I think more often than not, when someone says that, that they can only handle two sets on Monday, two sets on Thursday, otherwise their performance starts tanking. Their lifestyle's not that good. They've been, hitting the, they've been hitting the late night gay club Correct. a lot. Yes. Which is fun, but tiring. So but fun, lose. but really tiring. But like most of the time it is lifestyle related. Um, the final thing I'd say is that in light of this research, time-saving strategies, like we just discussed with the supersets, for example. Yes. Uh, anything that can allow you to get more volume in, in less time, if you have meaningful time constraints, will likely allow you to see more growth. Yes, it's kind of like, this is a terrible analogy, but it's kind of like happy hour ends in 30 minutes and the cheap beers are still cheap and you know it's going to take you five beers to feel the way you want to feel. It's time to get a few beers. So, because it used to be like, well, I don't have a lot of time to work out. And so it's okay. And I would watch people, Milo, with my own eyes, say they didn't have time to work out and then take three minute rest breaks look at their phone and I'm like, oh my fucking God, <laughs> if you don't rest as long, you can smush in more hypertrophy. Is it going to be more fatiguing? Yes. But because you train three days a week, workout fatigue is not a problem you experience in your life, not in the cumulative way, right? So it's a good idea to try to contract your rest periods a little bit, assuring that the local stimulus is still really good and really trying to figure out ways to push in more volume because more volume is probably one of the most reliable turn dials we have for more hypertrophy. If someone says, 
I want to get my intensity higher. Will that help me grow? And the answer is like, probably, unless you're already really intense and then it could be worse because you're getting too psychotic. Someone's like, should I get stronger? So definitely strength is a good measurement of hypertrophy over the long term. Short term, the best way to get stronger is to drop your volume <laughs> and have a, a preparedness increase and that actually makes you less jacked. But dialing up the volume over time is like, that's the thing that really is the button you could push. So just knowing that and then thinking, how am I going to design my plan is probably good instead of thinking, look, I'm already at 18 sets of biceps for the week. And someone's like, well, do you think 22? And they're like, that'd be too much, man. I don't want to overtrain. And it's like, how do you know? How do you know? And you can know because you just get weaker every week and your muscles feel all fucked up. But if the answer is like, no, it doesn't I feel like so. that. Yeah. Then it's like, well, you should do more. And everybody's just thinking about it. Nobody wants to hear that shit. Yeah. I don't want to hear more. Many people think they will overtrain. They don't really have an idea as to why. They're not exactly looking at the performance objectively. They yes. just think if they go above a certain amount they've heard thrown around, yes. they will overtrain. Yes. It doesn't work that and, way. And it's unlikely to happen. And also, before you overtrain, you overreach. And before you overreach non-functionally, you overreach functionally. And you'll notice it. You'll, you'll notice. notice. If your whole life feels like it's coming down on you, if you're sore everywhere, if you're weak, you just take a deal a week. And then you're back fresh and good. And then you can look back at the volumes you hit in your last week and go... That seems to be my local limit for a while. Let me go a little lower than that and climb back up to that. See if I can break it. True overtraining takes weeks or months to occur. Sure. Overreaching takes, can, can you can handle overreaching for a few weeks. Yes. All it takes is a deload. Yeah. So I think people are overly concerned about overtraining syndrome. Yeah. It doesn't sneak up on you. No. Uh, and when it does hit you, you'll know. And you just will not feel about the gym the same way. And then it's time to, to cool it off. Yeah. That's it. Awesome. Dude. Amazing. Super insightful as always. Where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at Wolf Coaching and you can find me on Instagram at Wolf Coach. See you on YouTube and Instagram and see you guys next time. Bye.